أبدأ بسم الله مستعينا رض به مدبرا معينا والحمد لله كما هدانا إلى سبيل الحق واجتبانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين مرحبا بكم my noble brothers and sisters to our second lesson on the book أربعين النووية by Imam Nawi and inshallah today we're going to go into the first hadith in this book. Last week we did a muqaddima of the book and also of the mu'allif, an introduction of the book and also the author. And we spoke a little bit about the author and the level this book has in hadith and the virtues of seeking knowledge as well too. The first hadith in this book over here, we're going to read it in Arabic, then the brother will translate it in English inshallah, then we'll explain it inshallah. الحديث الأول أن أمير المؤمنين أبي حفص عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته للدنيا يصيبها وامرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه اتفق عليه this narrated on the authority of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Abu Hafs, Allah, who said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Actions are judged by motives, sabiyya, so each man will have what he intended. Thus, he whose migration, hijrah, was to Allah and his Messenger, and his migration is to Allah and his Messenger. But he whose migration was for some worthy thing he might gain, or for a wife he might marry, his migration is to what for it's to them for what for which he migrated. This is in Bukhari Muslim. Before we get into the hadith, we're going to go on a little biography of the one who narrated this hadith. And the one who narrated this hadith, as we all know, is Umar ibn Khattab, who was the son of Khattab, ibn Nufayl, ibn Abdul Uzza, ibn Riyah, ibn Abdullah. And Umar radiallahu anhu was the second Khalifa. He was the second Khalifa and his nasab, his lineage, met with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in his eighth grandfather. His eighth grandfather, Ka'ab ibn al And Umar radiallahu anhu, he was born in the 13th year on the year of the elephant, Am al -fid. His kunya was Abu Hafs. And some scholars say that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, gave him this kunya. Hafs in Arabic language is from the names of lion. A lion. So they say the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, gave him this kunya. Umar radiallahu anhu, he became Muslim and accepted Islam in the fifth year of the prophecy. And some narrations say the sixth year. And before he accepted Islam, he was an ambassador for the Quraysh. Many the Quraysh, they used to send him around to different areas on their behalf to make negotiations and deals for them. And when Umar al-Khattab, when he accepted Islam, it was a great izzah and a great honor for the Muslims. Ali ibn Abi Talib, عنه, he said that when the people were migrating to Medina to go to Hijrah, the majority of the people, he did not know anybody who did not do it. He did not know anybody who did it publicly. Everybody did it secretly. The only one who went and did it publicly was Umar al Khattab. He was the only one that went to the Quraysh and he let them know that he's going to go to Hijrah publicly. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he mentioned how the Muslims were after Umar al Khattab accepted Islam. He said, That the Muslims have been powerful since Umar embraced Islam. And Imam Bukhari mentioned this over here. So when Umar became a Muslim, it was a big honor for the Muslims. Umar radiallahu anhu was the second Khalifa after Abu Bakr Siddiq. And Umar radiallahu anhu was the second Greatest companion after Abu Bakr Siddiq. When Abu Bakr Siddiq was dying, he's the one that chose Umar bin Khattab to become the Khalifa of the Muslims. And he was the Khalifa for 
roughly 10 years. And in the time that he was the Khalifa of the Muslims, a lot of lands and a lot of places were opened. For example, Sham, which is Palestine and Lebanon and Syria was open to the Muslims in the time of Umar al-Khattab And from his character was that he was a man who was a very humble man. Even though he was a leader, one would not be able to tell that he was a leader, a Khalifa, from the clothes he'd wear and how he used to eat and so on. To the point when the Muslims opened up Palestine and they were going over there and I think it was the Byzantine Empire that the Muslims took it from. So Umar came and when he was entering the city, Umar was taking times riding him and his servant that was with him. They were taking times riding on the camel. One would be on the camel while the other one pulls. The other one would be pulling while the other one goes. And he came and he wasn't wearing high class clothing as they would wear the non-Muslim leaders and so on. So when they seen Umar, they were very surprised. And that's how he was. He was a man who cared about the religion of Islam. He put his main focus on that. So we said Sham was open. Also Iraq was open in the time of Umar. Also Egypt was open in the time of Umar. Also countries like Uzbekistan and Armenia were open in the time of Umar. Some of the scholars say in the time of Umar, a hundred, a thousand and thirty-six cities were opened. When I mean open, that they accepted Islam. Scholars of Tariq, they say a thousand and thirty-six cities. So Umar's time was a great time for Ummah, and he was a great leader, and the Muslims were flourishing at that time. Umar radiallahu anhu, he died in the year twenty-three after the Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he died in Medina. He died while he was leading Salat al-Fajr in Medina. A man killed him. Does anyone know who's the man who killed him? Al-Majusi. Al-Lulu Al-Majusi. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he was known to go lead the prayer, the Fajr prayer. And he radiallahu anhu was known before he led that he would walk around the lines and to see if the lines were straightened and tell everybody to straighten their lines. So when he went to go pray, this man over here, Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, was not a Muslim. He stabbed Umar, and he stabbed him with a sword that had poison on it. And when Umar got stabbed, right away he screamed. He screamed right away, and he said, the dog killed me, or the dog ate me. And the Sahaba, they did not stop their salah. Rather, Umar radiallahu anhu, he put forward Abdurrahman ibn Auf anhu, to lead the Muslims. Some of the companions have to try to catch this individual over here and uh, it said that he killed a lot of companions. I don't know the exact number but he killed a lot of companions and then he killed himself. And then he killed himself. But the first thing Umar asked was who killed me? He wanted to know who killed him. And when they said it was this individual Umar said, Alhamdulillah, that it wasn't a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, that it wasn't a Muslim. So even though he got stabbed, and even though he, he, he would die through that wound over there, he did not want a Muslim to be the one that did this over here. And a lot of the Sahaba as well got killed like this. Uthman radiallahu anhu got killed while he was reading the Quran. Ali radiallahu anhu got killed while he was leading the Salah, Salat al-Fajr. Umar radiallahu anhu, when he got stabbed, he was alive for a few more days. And some of the scholars say, and he was in his house and people would come and visit him. They would come and visit him. And from the people that were coming and visiting him was a young boy who had garments that were below the ankle. That were below the ankle. And Umar, even though he was on his deathbed, he advised that young boy who had the garments below his ankle to keep it above his ankle. Umar radiallahu anhu knew he was going to die and he knew there was a spot available beside the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Abu Bakr was buried beside the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Umar knew that there was a spot available. That spot was, was belonged to Aisha radiallahu anha. So Umar, he sent his son Abdullah to go to Aisha and ask if he could get that spot. 
And Aisha, she really wanted a spot for herself, but she knew Umar was very close to her father. So Aisha agreed. And Umar also told his son, when I die, also go back and ask her one more time. Because maybe she's shy for me right now that I'm alive. But if I die, maybe she will want it for herself. I don't want it to be difficult for her. And Aisha gave it to him even though he died. So Umar radiallahu anhu, this was a small biography of Umar. Of course, he deserves a bigger biography than that. And as we said, Umar bin Khattab was the second best of the companions. The companions, their level in their virtues is Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, then Umar bin Khattab, then Uthman ibn Affan, then Ali. Then you go down to the rest of them. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he while Umar was alive, said a lot of great things about him. From the greatest things, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, he was from those ten who were promised jannah, ten who were promised jannah. So this hadith over here, as we said, it has to do with the intention. And a lot of the scholars they spoke about this hadith and spoke about the virtues that this hadith has. Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, who was from the scholars of before, from the Salaf, he said. If I made a book that had chapters in it, I would put this hadith in every single chapter. So for example, think about it. A book, Natin Fiqh for example, that has different chapters in it. This scholar over here said that he would put this hadith in every single chapter in that book. He also said, من أراد أن يصنف كتابا فليبدأ بحديث الأعمال بالنيات. Whoever who wants to publish or author a book, then let them start with this hadith over here. This hadith over here, Imam Shafi'i, may Allah have mercy on him, said this hadith is one third of the religion. It's one third of the religion. Imam Ahmed, may Allah have mercy on him, said that they are three hadiths that revolve around the religion, although the religion revolve around, or go around three hadith. And the first one he said is this hadith over here by Umar. And the second one is the hadith by Aisha, man ahdatha fi amrina. Whoever who brings an affair to the religion that is not from the religion, that will be rejected. طيب, and it's, it's in this book as well too, and the third hadith that he mentioned is Nu'mal ibn Bashir's hadith, radiallahu anhumah, Al-halal ubayin wa al-haram ubayin. The halal is clear and the haram is clear. So, brothers, as you see, this hadith over here, it has a great status amongst the scholars. Why? Because the intention is something that somebody will always struggle with. Somebody's always going to struggle with their intention. And inshallah, we're going to go bits by bits explaining the hadith. So the first part of the hadith, إِنَّمَ الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily, actions are based upon the intentions behind them. And the meaning of actions are based upon the intentions behind them, as the scholars say, is ibadat, worship, when it comes to worship. Meaning the salah, meaning when one is making wudu. Any act of worship in Islam, one will have to have that good intention. But when it comes now to Actions that are not worship, they're not for ta'a, they're not for obedience, obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, one putting on a garment, or for example, one drinking, or for example, one driving a car. Then one does not have to have an intention with these actions over here. Why? Because they are not actions that are for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second part of the hadith and every man shall have in accordance with what he intended. The scholars, they differed with this over here. Some of the scholars said that this is the same meaning as the first part. It's the same meaning. The first group of scholars say it's the same meaning, but it's emphasizing it. It's putting tawqid in it. That one should know it's important. The Arabs, when they want something to be important, they emphasize in it. So one knows it's important. The other group of scholars say, no, this is different than that. And it's not the same meaning as it. And 
the reason why they say it's not the same meaning as if they say the first part, very actions are based upon the intentions behind them, then this over here means that if one does an action and they are intending it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are intending it only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this action is correct. When it comes to al-ibadat, as we said, when it comes to worship, then if one is only doing it for Allah, then this action is an action that is correct. But if one is doing this action not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this action is not correct. This action will not be accepted. We say, إِنَّمَ الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ That's what it means. And then they say the second part, وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِ مَا نَوَىٰ And every man shall have in accordance with what he intended. They say this is from the angle of a thawab of rewards and rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning if one does it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it will be accepted and if one does not do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it will be rejected so the first part in the mal'amal biniyat this comes from the abd comes from the servant that the servant has to have the right intention when they're doing what we said ibadah when it comes to Worship. The second part of it is for what? It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the reward. Everybody's with me? The meaning of niyyah. What is the meaning of niyyah? The scholars, they have two opinions or two views that they say the meaning of intention is. The first group of scholars, which are generally the scholars of fiqh. They deal with the jurisprudence. They say a niyyah is something known as a tamiz, which is to distinguish. And an example of that is to distinguish an act of worship from another act of worship. For example, to distinguish your fard salah, if you're praying duhr, for example, to your sunnah salah, if you're praying the sunnah, your intention is going to do tamiz, it's going to distinguish between that. And they also say that it distinguishes between the customs of the people, the urf and the adat of the people, to something that is worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do I mean by that? For example, Yom al Jum'ah. Yom al Jum'ah, there is the ghusl of Jum'ah. We know this is a sunnah. So let's say two people. One person wakes up before Salat al Jum'ah, they go to the gym, they go work out, they do something, they come back. And they, their ada is that they do this. Their custom is that they always do this. And they take their, also they take their shower. And for example, there's a different person over here. This individual knows the fadl and has the intention to do ghusl before Jum'ah because he knows the reward. So he does it. So there's a difference between this. One of them is doing it for the sake of Allah with the intention of the reward. The other one is doing it to get cleaned up. He's not doing it with the intention to get the reward. So this is a tamiz. It shows the difference between them. The other group of scholars, which is generally the ulama of Aqidah and a lot of the other salaf that they would write books, they say, Aniyah is al-ikhlas. Aniyah is al-ikhlas. It's sincerity. How one's action should be done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever who brings riyah in it, for example, and shows off in it, then this will go under shirk al-asbar. It will go under shirk al-asbar. And intention is something that the pious generation, the salaf, that they would they would worry about how their intention was. They would worry about if, and these were righteous men and women, they would worry about the actions they're doing. Are they doing it for Allah and only Allah? So Sufyan authority, may Allah have mercy on him, he said, there is nothing more difficult upon me than my intention, than my niyyah, than my intention. Because it switches. And this was an imam, he was a scholar of hadith, he was a scholar of fiqh, that he would worry about his intention. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, he said that possibly a small action could be great due to the intention behind it. Due to the intention that one has, a small action, that a worship that is for the sake of Allah and only Allah, it could be great due to the intention 
that is behind it. And then a big action could be small due to the intention that is behind it. Fudayl ibn Iyad, who was also from the Salaf, when he was explaining the ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا so that, so that which of you may be tested in good deeds. So that which of you may be tested in the good deeds you've done. When he was explaining this over here, and they asked him, what does this mean? He said, أَخْلَصَهُ aswabi." It is the most sincere and the most correct. And then he said, إِنَّ الْعَمَلَ إِذَا كَانَ خَالِسًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ صَوَابًا لَمْ يُقْبَلْ For verily, if an action is done sincerely, but it is not done correctly, then it will not be accepted. وَإِذَا كَانَ صَوَابًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ خَالِسًا لَمْ يُقْبَلْ And if it is done correct, but if it is not done sincerely, then it will not be accepted. When is it going to be accepted? حَتَّى يَكُونَ خَالِسًا صَوَابًا Until it is done sincerely, correctly. And they said, what does this mean? What is sincerely and correctly that he's talking about? He said, الخالص إذا كان لله Sincerely is that which is done for the sake of Allah and only Allah. والصواب إذا كان على سنتي And correctness is that which is done upon the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. So what we understand is every single act of worship from the statement over here, every single act of worship needs two things. First of all, one has to have the correct intention, meaning the correct niyyah that they are doing it for the sake of Allah and only Allah, not to get praise from anybody, only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have to make sure that this act of worship they're doing is from the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That one could come and they could be sincere for the sake of Allah and say, Ohur, you're supposed to pray for rakahat, but I'm sincere for the sake of Allah and I love Allah so much that I'm going to add an extra one. This is not going to be accepted. And why is this not going to be accepted? Because you're not doing it correctly. You're not doing it from the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا And whatever the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told you to do or to take, then take. So every single action in Islam, one has to make sure they have the correct intention and one has to make sure that they are doing it correctly. And my noble brothers and sisters, as we know, in the Day of Judgment, the first three people who will be questioned are going to be number one is going to be one who strove for the sake of Allah and the second one is going to be one that learned the Quran or learned the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the third one is going to be one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possessed with a lot of wealth that they give all that wealth and these three people are going to be questioned and the first one who strove for the sake of Allah is going to say I was martyred on your path I did this and this and this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to say, Kadhat, you lied. You did this so that people could say that you are brave. And the people could say you are strong. Then this individual's face will be grabbed and they will be thrown in the hellfire. And the second individual, the one who learned the Quran or the religion, will say, I learned the Quran for your sake. I learned the religion for your sake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Kadhat. Verily, you learned it so people could say you're a Qari. People could say you're a Qari, that you're a reciter. And so people could say that you are a Adam or someone who has learned the religion. Then this individual's face will be grabbed and they will be thrown in the hellfire. And the third individual is similar, the individual who possessed a lot of wealth and who gave all that wealth for the sake of Allah. Or a large portion of that wealth for the sake of Allah. And this individual will say, I gave my wealth for your sake, and I did this for your sake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Kadat, okay, you lied. You did this so people could say you're generous. And then he will also be grabbed and thrown in the hellfire. Three people who did three righteous deeds from the best deeds of an Islam. But all of them thrown in the hellfire. Why? Because they did not come with that correct intention. And the one who comes with that correct intention is one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with. And one who does not come with a correct intention by doing those actions is one who will be thrown in the fire. So it's very important that the Muslim knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees them.
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that as we know ihsan, perfection is and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see Allah فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاهُ for verily you cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you so the abd, the servant, they should always worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you don't worry about the praise of the people what the people say as long as you are acting upon your religion to the best of your ability and you're doing actions that please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that should be a ghaya. That should be the Muslims' ghaya, where they want to reach. These three men, they brought something known as a riyah, showing off. A riyah. And riyah, showing off, is the definition of it is if one shows off in an action that is salih, an action that is righteous, so people could praise him. And this over here is, the hukum of it is shirk al-asghar. The hukum of it is minor shirk. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, for verily what I fear for you guys to fall into is minor shirk. Minor shirk. And showing off shir, uh, is in actions, what we said, riyaz in actions. There's something that also goes alongside riyah known as a tasmi'ah. A tasmi'ah. Saying statements so people could hear. Showing off with statements. As we said, riyaz with the a'mal. That's with the actions. A tasmi'ah is something that you will do with your mouth. For example, you will go tell an individual, I stand up at night and I pray the night prayer. Telling this individual this because you want this individual to think that you are uh, a good and you are pious and for him or for her to think highly of. Then this will fall under the same category as Ariyah, even though if Ariyah, as we said, is what's it called, is with the A'mal. But this will still fall under that category over there. Everybody's with me? Tayyib, what's the athar? What's the effects that Riyah will leave in one's actions? What's the effects that showing off Riyah will leave in one's actions? As we've seen in these three men over here, or here that we mentioned in Hadith, it led them to what? It led the actions not being accepted. It let the actions not being accepted. So one thing that we could understand is if riyah is in all of the actions, kulli, it's in all of the actions, and I'll explain what I mean by all the actions in a little bit. If it's in all the actions, then by the consensus of the ulama, by tafaq al-ulama, then it will not, the action will not be accepted. For example, the salah. The salah, as we know, it has different types of actions in the salah that we do. How does one enter the salah? What is the first thing one do? So you just jump in the salah. Tayyib, qablaha. What does one do? Tadbir al So if one, before they enter the salah, before they make their takbir, they see a sheikh walk by in the masjid. And they need something from the sheikh over here. And they want the sheikh to know them. So they go stand beside the sheikh and they want the sheikh to see that their prayer is upright and straight. So they make the takbir al-ihram with showing off, with the iya in it. And there's other actions that come in. In the salah, as we all know, there's other actions. This individual, from the beginning to the end, shows off in their prayer. This individual's prayer, after he does a taslim, his prayer is not accepted. What is required for this individual to do? If the act is an act that is wajib, then this individual has to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has to redo the act. For example, that's salah we're talking about. This individual would have to make tawbah and would have to redo that salah because it's wajib. Tayyib, what if it is mustahab? If it is something recommended? For example, taraweeh. And this individual is in Masjid al nabawi in Medina. And this individual usually prays maybe half of what the Imam prays in Taraweeh. But today, he has that same Sheikh beside him again. And he wants that Sheikh to think that he's upright. Or she wants that Sheikh to think that she is upright. So to, from the beginning, from the beginning of the worship, when he enters it, 
till the end. He stays today till when the Imam is going to finish. Doing this to show off and for this individual to think they're okay. This is something that is mustahab. As we know, tarawih prayer is not wajib. It's something that is recommended. Okay, this individual, after the taslim, and this individual knows what he did is wrong. What is required for this individual to do? Toba, best, or do they have to go pray their salah again? Ahsant. They don't have to pray their salah again because it was not wajib. But what is required for them to do is toba. So we said if riya is generally in all of the actions, then it is not accepted. Meaning it's going to make the action be not accepted. Okay, so what if riya is in some of the actions? Showing off is in some of the actions. Is it going to be accepted or is it not going to be accepted? Taib. The first one is if riya is in the asal, the original of the action. For example, the takbir al-ihram that we talked about in salah. One starts off with riya in the takbir al-ihram. In the middle of it over here, he or she knows that what they are doing is wrong. They know what they're doing is wrong. And they become sincere for the sake of Allah while they're doing it. And they finish their tislim. What is required for this, this individual over here is to redo the action. Why? Because it was in the asal of it. It was in the original of it. And for example, that is the person the person is praying. And they started off with the riyah, the takbir al-ihram, because they want to show off to somebody. But they hear, Ya can abudu wa ya can astain. You Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone do we worship. You Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone do we seek help and assistance. So it affects them. This is tawheed that affects their heart and they change it in the middle of that saying that I'm only going to do it for the sake of Allah. When they finish salah, they, even though they made their tawbah, what is apparent in the salah, but what is required from them as the scholars say is they have to redo the action. They have to redo the action if it's something that is wajib. If it's something that's mustahab, then it's okay. And they have to redo the action. Why? Because it came from the asal of it, the original of the action. But the second one is if riya is in an act of worship but is in the middle of it. Is in the middle of it. For example, the person who started off their salah, mukhlisan lillah, sincere for the sake of Allah. Then in the middle of the action, somebody walked by and they're looking at the person, so riya came to them and they want to show off to the person. Then they hear Allahu Akbar. Allah is great. And Allahu Akbar is something that should make the believer's heart shake and ponder every time they hear it. Because Allah is truly great. So they hear this, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. They hear this and they say, SubhanAllah, why am I showing off for this creation over here when I'm praying for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So they started off mukhlisan. They had riya in the middle of it showing off to an individual that walked by. They pondered and thought to themselves, why am I doing this? They changed back their intention, doing it for the sake of Allah. They did taslim in the salah. What is the ruling of this individual's act? The scholars say the ruling of this individual's act is the person will not have to do the act again. The person will not have to do the act again. Rather, the person has already made what is apparent to be toba in there and because the asl of the action that they did was mukhlis and lillah sincere for Allah when they entered the prayer even though they drifted away a little bit this individual over here will not have to redo the act again the third case scenario is an individual who goes into salah that is fard, a fard salah and he or she enters it mukhlis and enter it Sincerely for the sake of Allah. And in the middle of it over there, they show off. An individual comes by and they show off. They show off for that individual. And they continue like that till it's done. They continue like that till it's done and they make their tasli. The ulama differed in this, but from what we heard from our Sheikh, Sheikh Sulaiman Ruhaili, and a lot of other scholars, is that this individual will have to make tawbah and redo the action again 
if the action is wajib, if it's something that is obligatory for the individual. But if it's something that's mustahab, something that is recommended, then the person will have to make tawbah. If it's something that's wajib, the person will have to make tawbah, and the person will have to redo the action again. Okay. Who can mention those three scenarios that we said? Naam. Correct? Riya and showing off, as we said, is shirk al asghar is minor shirk. Shirk al asghar minor shirk, does not take one out of the fault of al Islam, but it could take one out of the fault of Islam. Give me a scenario of one who is doing this minor shirk riya, but it takes him out of the fault of Islam. Who can give me a scenario of that? If one is showing off, but it goes and becomes shirk al akbar and it takes this individual out of Islam. What is an example of it? Yeah. How could minor shirk turn into major shirk? An example, if they hold this person is equal to Allah or greater than Allah. If they hold this person is equal to Allah or greater than Allah. So if somebody shows off and the person who they're showing off to, they hold this person is equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this leaves minor shirk and this goes to shirk al-akbar. It goes to the major shirk. طيب, the second part of this hadith or the last part of this hadith over here speaks about hijra, migration. Hijra in the Arabic language linguistically, it means tark. It means to leave something off. To leave something off. And Islamically, hijrah means it is one leaving the land of disbelief, going towards the land of Islam, running to safeguard their religion. Running to safeguard their religion. So, for example, the Sahaba, they migrated from Mecca to Medina to go safeguard their religion. Why? Because their religion became difficult for them to act upon in Mecca. So they went to Medina, which was Dar al-Islam, so they could act upon their religion. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Whoever whose migration is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, then his migration will be for that. So the first part, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ Whoever whose migration is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this over here means the one who has the correct intention to go migrate for the sake of Allah. Then this person, this individual, will get the reward as a muhajir, as a muhajir, similar to the reward that the companions took when they migrated from Mecca to Medina. Why? Because this individual over here is doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they feel like they are being harmed and they cannot act upon their religion and it is becoming difficult for them. So they go migrate for the sake of Allah. And this individual over here will be written as if he is someone who is a migrator. That's what his reward will be. And the second part of this over here, مَنْ كَانَ تِجْرَتُهُ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ For the one whose migration is for other than Allah. For example, مَنْ كَانَ تِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُسِيبُهَا The one who migrates for worldly life matters. To a Muslim land, for example, this individual lives in a non-Muslim land and they go migrate to Dar al-Islam. They go migrate to a Muslim country but the reason they go migrate to that Muslim country is because the business there is excellent. The business there is excellent for worldly life matters. Then this person over here is not going to be written that he or she is from the Muhajir, meaning that they get the reward for migrating. They are not going to be written as that over there. Or an individual goes and migrates from a non-Muslim land to a Muslim land for the purpose of marriage, to go marry a woman. In this case, a man, to go marry a woman. For example, if the sister tells the brother, the only way I'll marry you is if you come to my country, and they live in a Muslim country. 
And the brother goes over there with that purpose, and even though he's going to be living over there, but he's not going to get the reward similar to someone who had left the same non-Muslim country as him and traveled to that same Muslim country or another Muslim country for the purpose of their religion. They're not going to get the same deed because one did it for the sake of Allah. And in this case over here, for the one who travels to get married to a woman, some of the scholars say that there was a woman named Umm Al-Qais. Umm Al-Qais and that there was a man who was amongst the companions when they were migrating and that he went to go marry that woman, Umm Al-Qais. His intention was to marry that woman and that he did not get the same reward as the others. But from what a lot of the scholars say, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali in his explanation, he says that there is no sanad, there is no chain that shows this is correct. And that this could be just a story. So from what we understand from here is the one who migrates, that does an action for the sake of Allah, it will be held very high. It will be held very high. طيب, if one is going to go to this Muslim country now to go do business or to go do for dunya matters or to go get married, is this person a person that is sinning or committing an act of sin? No, this person is not committing an act of sin. This is something that is lawful. I mean, it is something permissible for that individual. But what this hadith is talking about, the one who travels and migrates for hardship for their religion for the sake of Allah, then they will be accepted for what they travel for. And the one who, for example, two people go to a Muslim country. One went because they are dealing with hardship. One went to that same Muslim country and they went there because they want to get married. Their intentions were different. The one whose intention was that he or she are going there for the deen, the ajli deen, because it was tough for them to act upon their religion where they are upon, then they will be accepted as a mahajir. They will get that good deed. So this hadith shows you that if one does an action for the sake of Allah, it will always be held high. If two do the same actions, but one is for Allah and one is for other than Allah, it will always, the one for Allah will always be held high. Before we finish this hadith over here, an important part where the scholars always speak about when they deal with this hadith is where, where is the mahal of the niyyah? Where is the niyyah? Where does one's intention come from? The mahal is al-qalb. The mahal of the niyyah, it comes from the heart. Some, and it's not, it's not something that one does to love with the niyyah. It says it with their tongue. As some of the later generation of the Shafi'is and also the Hanbalis. The Hanbalis as well too. A lot of times, a lot of people just only say the Shafi'is. But you never hear the Hanbalis as well too. The Hanabila as well too, their later generations, they said in acts of worship, that intention will come with their tongue, their mouth. Same as the Shafi'is. For example, a lot of us come from a Somali background. Um, so when we've seen probably some of our family members when they're about to pray, they say they make the intention out loud. And this over here is completely wrong. And it is something that is not attributed to the religion. And there's plenty of reasons why it's wrong. Number one, this over here was not attributed to Imam Shafi'i. Imam Shafi'i himself did not do this over here or to say to do this. Number two, even if Imam Shafi'i said that this was okay and that this is permissible, then Imam Shafi'i is not a hujjah. His statement is not going to be taken in this. Imam Shafi'i is a mujtahid. Imam Shafi'i is a mujtahid. He's someone who is a scholar and he could make his judgments. And as we know, a mujtahid, the one who does it for the sake of Allah and is making their judgments, then if they are wrong, they'll get a good deed. But what is a hujjah and what is a proof and what is a statement is the kalam and the statement of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Not the kalam of Shafi'i or Ahmed or Abu Hanifa or Malik. And if we're saying these great scholars, then of course the scholars of today will fall into the same category for mentioning those at Imma. These scholars' statements will not be hujjah. They will not be proof. The only way it's going to be proof, إِذَا وَافَقَ الدَّلِيلِ If it goes alongside 
and evidence in Islam. And wallahi, my noble brothers, this is a great hadith. From what we heard, Sufiya and Athori, in the statements we heard, this great tabi'i, that Allah have mercy on him, that he used to say, the hardest thing that I struggle with is my intention. And this is how the Salaf were. Some of them at night time, they used to grab their beard while they're talking to themselves. And they used to say, if I die today, I don't know if I'll be from the people of Jannah or if I'll be from the people of Hellfire. So no one thing, if one always is worried about their state and their state of actions and they are not pleased with their actions and they are not, when I mean pleased, proudful, proudful about it, then this person is in a good way compared to the one who does all of the actions but is pleased with it and they think that they are doing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a favor. No, the believer should not be in that situation. Rather, the believer should always wonder what their situation will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we're going to stop here. Next week, we'll do Hadith Jibreel. We'll probably do that in two lessons, two or three lessons. It's a bit long hadith. If there's questions, brothers, write it down and give me a paper. We'll answer the questions in the next class. And sisters, they can leave the questions on the table in the sister side. And inshallah, we'll answer it in the next class. وَهَذَا وَصَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى نَبِيْنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ يَجْمَعِينَ